Welcome to our Florence webinar series. Today's session is on how to safely manage incidents. I'm Tamana Faisi, Head of Marketing at Florence, the app that fills shifts with people you trust. Today, I'm joined by Fiona Millington, Chief Nurse and Head of Governance at Florence, and Jenny, who's also Governance and Risk Lead in Primary Care. Um, I'm gonna head up, shoot over to you, Fiona, for a brief introduction on your experience in care. Hi Tamana, I, as you rightly said, I'm Fiona Millington, I'm Chief Nurse at Florence. Um, I've been a registered nurse for many years, uh, but latterly I've been very much focused around governance and compliance and safety and professional fairness in the workforce. Thank you. Tamana, I'm uh, Jenny Coverley. I I'm a governance and risk lead in primary care currently. I've got experience in working in the acute sector and um, starting out in clinical audit and then worked up to um, become a divisional governance and risk lead. Um, and then uh, went to work in social care, setting up a governance structure there um, and then back into the NHS and now I'm in primary care. So I've had experience in all sorts of fields in terms of governance, which is great. Amazing, thank you. Um, I guess we'll dive right in. And my first question for you both is, what is governance and why is it so important? So from my view, governance is, in short, pretty much about doing the right thing at the right time um, with the right person. Um, and within the NHS, there's a governance framework. Um, we tend to call it the pillars of governance, and it's kind of like an umbrella term. Um, that covers all sorts of things such as openness, risk management, clinical effectiveness, research and development as well, which I'm not as heavily involved with, um, training staff, clinical audit, um, and importantly, patient involvement as well. I certainly agree with that. And um, I, I always say that governance done well, you don't really notice because it goes along in the background, uh, everything is done right, everything is in place. But when governance is done poorly, that's when you start to notice that things go wrong and uh, you start to have problems with sort of cultural um, engagement and uh, safety and assurances. Um, and so government governance is, is really a, 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 an, an essential component of any organization, um, particularly in healthcare, but it can be a you know, across corporate finance and and all sorts of other um, organizations. Um, but you know, essentially in, in healthcare, you need really good governance because if you don't have it, you have this major risk to resident patient service user safety, and also it damages your 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 cultural values, if you like. It damages the way that people um, experience employment within your organization. So it's a huge, huge thing that really has to be managed really well. Um, and as a result of that can really result in enhanced safety, reduced risk, greater morale, um, and, and, and happier workforce altogether. And, you know, you know, the service users then get the, the best care that they, they're, they're entitled to. I would add as well, though, that um, good governance is dependent on lots of different things. Um, and there is lots of history within the NHS. And you'll have no doubt heard of lots of different inquiries, such as the Francis Inquiry, the recent Ockenden Report, um, last September, I think it was the East Kent uh, maternity scandal. Um, these have all highlighted that failures at various different levels within the NHS has compounded in, and led to bad governance, which has put patients at risk. So things like organisational culture, leadership, accountability, effective regulation, all lead to good governance as well. Um, so that is very much a top-down approach that, and, and things that really need to be embedded at a leadership level within an organisation, which and, and they the use the term from bed to board in the NHS. Um, really, it's the board's responsibility to hold um, the organisation to account. And actually, the regulators then should be holding the boards to account as well. Absolutely. And, and I think, you, 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 you know, you raise that really important issue around in the NHS. There's this standardised structure of governance. There's this standardised expectation that governance is led from the very top and it filters all the way down to um, the experience of the person 
re receiving services um, and it's and it's very structured within the NHS. There is a very well-known expectation. Governance has grown up with the NHS over the last 20 or 30 years to make it a much more safer, open, honest and accountable organisation. In social care, we're, I, I, my experiences in social care are that we're some way behind. You know, we're very much um, in social care, a patchwork of organisations. No one organisation does governance in exactly the same way as any other organisation. And you've got this myriad of very small organisations. Um, if we're talking about social care, care homes, for example, you might have um, an organisation that has two or three care homes and they manage governance in one way and then you get these huge or uh you know corporate groups um you know uh, bupa four seasons healthcare who will manage governance in an entirely different way there's some similarities there's definitely going to be some crossover um but there's not the expectation that organization a will manage governance in the same way that organization b will um and a lot of that comes down to you know understanding, learning, cultures where fear um, persists within an organisation where, you know, uh, adverse events are reported. Um, <clears throat> so this is very much, uh, in terms of social care, uh, an opportunity to build on those governance structures within your own organisations, to build up that strength, to build up that confidence um, and to reduce the risk of, of of these adverse events from occurring. So the governance itself is is a is a huge aspect of any care delivery of any healthcare organisation. But the way governance processes are structured can really vary quite distinctly from from one organisation to the next. And you will find that in the NHS there is much more standardised processes because that is enforced by organisations such as NHS England. But even then you've got um, 230 different trusts across England who all do things in a different way, who all consider risks to be different at different levels. Um, but one thing that I did notice when I moved from the NHS into social care was that there is very much an open culture within the NHS of sharing learning and sharing what one trust has done and how another trust can learn from that. Whereas because of the way social care is set up, they, these are individual organisations and they are private businesses and therefore there is competition. And so why would we, why on earth would we share our uh, learning from this incident with a competitor? Um, because that just makes us look bad. Um, so there's, there's that extra hurdle, I think, in social care and to some degree in primary care as well, because ultimately GP practices in particular are individual organisations, they're businesses in their own right. Um, so there's this this fear of why would we air our dirty laundry? We, you know, doesn't that expose us? Doesn't that put us at risk? But actually, by not and by not sharing, that puts patients and the residents and service users at greater risk as well because we've got a potential to learn from other organisations. It's a free learning opportunity, um, and really, my ethos is that should be embraced. Wow, that's so interesting. Um, as you guys were saying, you know, every everyone is different in the way they do things. It just you know CQC popped in my head like how can how, how does CQC play a role in that then if every organization does things so differently um is there a universal rule that they need to follow or care homes like how can they protect themselves care homes especially well I think all regulators work quite differently um but they all work towards a common aim and that is that they are protecting the the rights of the service users across all different types of organizations whether that be primary care NHS social care um but they're also protecting the rights of the people who work within it so they also want to make sure that the right training is in place that the right staffing ratio is in place that the environment is safe for for people to work in and live in um and they and they do this through a standardized framework of of assessment and uh inspection um and they use obviously they use uh their own intuitive and um uh information gathering systems in order to get the best view 
of that if we take care homes for example um they 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 use the information that they get, can get externally from feedback from service users from feedback from people who buy into those services to enable them to make a, a statement around the safety and and uh, the assurance levels on, and and how well these organizations are being run um both in terms of governance but in terms of health and safety uh, and all of those other of all of those other sort of requirements that they that they have to make sure that the service is safe for those service users um the the importance of having that regulatory approach means that everybody understands what is expected of them as a, as an organization providing services um and it's relatively clear, you know, the CQC, the Care Inspectorate, the RQIA, they're transparent organisations. They provide you with evidence. They provide you with support around how you can improve your service right the way through from, you know, how it, what, what is the best way to recruit um, people into your service? And then once they're recruited, how can you retain them? Because retention within the social care sector at the moment is so poor um, and, and very well documented that it's so poor. You know, pe people are really challenged. Um, and that's why, you know, that regulatory compliance is so important. But from the service user perspective, you want to go to, um, a, you know, a central repository, for example, the CQC, who who publishes their reports and, and gives you the opportunity to see where, you know, a care home that you're looking at excels or or, or, or where they're struggling and, and might need a little bit of support, you know, and then you make your decision um, around whether that care home is right for you on the basis of what you're reading. So, um, you know, the, 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 the regulators are, are there to support organisations and to guide and provide, you know, guidance around the best way to, to run your organisation. Um, but actually, they're also there to challenge organisational practice and 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 they can implement you know all sorts of embargoes on an organization if they feel that their the practice is unsafe that makes a lot of sense and then i guess you know for a care home to be able to do that efficiently and effectively they need to create an environment for their staff to actually be honest when these things happen and react uh, promptly like how can and that could be quite a scary scenario for some for an, especially a new nurse i guess and so how can how can care home managers or just care homes in general support their staff through the process? Absolutely. Well, well, I mean that's a that's a huge thing, and and you can break that down into three separate sections because supporting staff will come with safe management. We've we've come with good practical management, um, and managing incidents safely because mostly we're talking about incident management and the management of adverse events and you know we're, we're human beings so uh it's very likely that ad adverse events will occur um and sometimes they occur without any real understanding of how they've occurred or some sometimes it's barn door obvious why the incidents have occurred it's it's how you identify the, that the complexity of what's caused that incident um and and what actions you take to reduce the risk of it happening again so you know managing incidents safely is a really important place to start when you're trying to make your organization well low risk reduce the risk um you know in, improve the experiences that that service users and the staff that are working there are, are having um and, and very often this you know that that whole issue of safety aligns with the culture the cultural organization the, cu the culture within the organization um if you agree with me there jenny from your experience yeah. i think i think reporting culture is really essential but that comes from um within the that comes from the leadership um so if you encourage reporting and um, if you support staff when they do report if you can um, demonstrate to them that they're getting feedback from the incident reports they're making that then promotes an ongoing um, reporting culture um, and then it depends how you respond to those incidents as well so if you whip out the HR policy straight away and say we're going to discipline you you're on your ear out <laughs> who's going to report <laughs> you know and if you're not reporting that then puts patients at risk that results in things being brushed under the carpet there's nothing to see here 
you know, let's move on. Um, and where's the patient left in that? Um, so it, it really does focus the mind when you think that a patient's put at harm by potentially um, taking someone down an HR route. In the future, people will not report if um, they think that their jobs are at risk, they've got children to feed, they've got mortgages to pay, you know, they will do what they need to do to keep themselves safe. Um, and, you know, if the culture is not there to support them and to evidence that they are supporting them, things like the Just Culture Guide. So this is a guide that's been approved by um, the NMC, the CQC, the RCN, Unison. Um, it's something that's used throughout the NHS. Um, but it's in particular, it's a non-punitive guide. As long as you haven't, you know, made a mistake um, deliberately, maliciously, you will be supported um, to, you know, make sure that you can learn from that and that there are systems in place to support you as an individual um, and, but also to have a look at the context in which the incident happened. And, you know, human factors that play a big part in the majority of incidents. Very often people don't come to work to make mistakes on purpose. You know, the things happen around them that result in those things happening. So you might be on a busy med round, you might, might be being interrupted, um, pay, uh, residents might be calling over to you, you, you might have been on your feet all day, not been able to get nipped to the loo, you know, things happen to us as humans that mean that we aren't performing at our best, and human factors um, asks us to take into account all those things that allow humans to, to maximise their performance, and looking at the context of, of everything that goes on around incidents is so essential um, to evidencing to staff that we're not that we're not looking for somebody to blame we're looking at how as an organization we can make this better and easier and reduce the risk of this happening again in the future absolutely and 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 going back to the cqc there's there's a level of reporting that's expected so uh, an incident that is not reporting any uh, sorry an organization that is not reporting any incidents at all is not the safest incident in the uh, safest organization in the world it's one that's not reporting so that this 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 sort of uh, uh, think thinking this thought process that um we're reporting too many incidents is 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 a fallacy really because actually if you're reporting incidents you've got an open culture you've got a safe culture people do not fear that kind of blame um, culture around reporting incidents. It might be that you're, you know, when you when you're looking at your incidents, you realise that you've got a very high number of, of of infections, for example. In which case, this gives you the opportunity then to look in and say, okay, well, why are we getting this number of infections? Have we got a problem with our, our hand washing technique? Have we got a problem that's an environmental problem? Uh, you know, are our service users living in, in too close a proximity? Do we need to change our cleaning fluids? So, you know, the, 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 the situations that arise around looking inwardly and understanding themes is much more important than actually being worried about, you know, the numbers. If you can demonstrate to the regulators that you've identified a problem and you've put all of these things into place to sort it and to solve it, and then the evidence later demonstrates that those actions have been effective, then the regulators are much more interested in that and they're much more congratulatory with you for identifying what the problem is, putting some uh, actions into place and then revaluating your activity afterwards to demonstrate, you know, good practice and, and an improvement in circumstance. So the whole concept of managing incidents safely starts with that culture of open reporting, starts with that culture where people have that psychological safety, they have trust within the organisation that they're, as Jenny rightly says, they're not going to get sacked because somebody's had a fall in the night or um, a pressure sore has developed, pressure injury has developed. Um, but actually the, 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 the leadership and the clinical leadership within that organisation are going to look in and go, OK, is this a one off? What are the factors associated with this or is this endemic You know, within our organisations? We need to do something much bigger with our workforce to 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 reduce the risks of these happening. But um, that said, the practicalities of managing incidents has has to be a little bit more robust, and um, yeah, uh, practically managing incidents comes. I, I think starts with a leadership culture, as Jenny's already said, that wants to understand what the risks are or what the adverse events are. But actually, 
that you've got a system in place where you can practically record those incidents. Um, and I know Jenny, you're a bit of a you're a bit of a whiz on all thing incident systems. I don't think it'd be worth you talking through what you might look for in uh, in an incident management system because not everybody can afford the big ones. You know, sometimes you do have to have a system that the best one in the world and I know we're trying to get rid of paper but sometimes having a written incident report but it's about you know collecting that de that detail in uh, safely so I'll, I'll leave you to Jenny's words of wisdom <laughs> <laughs> I mean I'm a bit of a fan of Datix myself just because that's what I've used historically um, but I know there are other incident management systems out there ideally you need something that can be locally managed um, and that can be kept confidential to the people who need to know about the incident. So if you're reporting an incident about Fiona Millington, you don't want Fiona Millington to get a notification straight away. Oh, Jenny's just reported an incident about you because that then leads to oh, this kind of you know, cultural clash almost. Or if you've, if you've reported one about me, I'm gonna report one about you. And you don't want that kind of um, competitive um, telling on each other um, um, culture within an organization. instant form it shouldn't be you know 50 different tick boxes it's got to be a, once you've mastered it it's got to be a five minute job to be able to report an incident or to pick out themes and trends so it's really important and for me this is where I've ended up having to use an excel spreadsheet because it's much better than what I had before um you need to be able to identify how many for example information governance incidents we've had how many um, infection control incidents we've had um, but to drill down that even further, so for example, in the care homes, is there a particular floor that we've got infections on? Um, and uh, I think when we were working together, there was, a, there was a home that had eye infections on the same floor or something. Um, and that, you know, the system allowed us to drill down to that level, which was really useful and allowed us allowed us to act on that at the time. Um, it should be, we should get automatic reminders. So as, as leaders, you need to be able to get automatic reminders about if you are outstanding incidents, they haven't been looked at yet. Um, if they need more in-depth analysis, so for example, um, there are various tools that NHS England in particular recommends, and um, they are currently moving away from the serious incident framework um, in favour of the patient safety incident response framework. The serious incident framework um, encourages the use of root cause analysis, which um, looks at each individual incident and tries to identify what the trigger factors are for those. Patient safety incident response moves more towards various different options in terms of what works best for you as an organization um, and what your biggest risks are as an organization. So there are various tools that you can use. And those incident reporting systems need to be able to help direct you towards those tools. They need you to identify whether duty of candor is triggered, for example. Um, so if an incident has caused moderate or severe harm, you need to be um, reminded to, to follow the duty of candor process. Um, and it needs to be accessible for everybody. You shouldn't have to log in to report an incident. You need to be able to report incidents anonymously because if you're encouraging that anonymous reporting, as much as you'd rather people didn't have to feel that they had to report anonymously, it's better to have an anonymous report than no report at all because it allows you to act on it. Um, perfect world, everybody would feel happy reporting everything and you know be happy for their names to be known, but we know we don't live in a perfect world. So yeah, there's lots of various, various different things that kind of feed into a really effective incident management system, but it's so key. If you've got that system that allows people feel to be, feel free to report, allows you as a manager to effectively investigate that and document it. It needs to become a central repository for all your evidence around that incident. So your duty of candor letters, your root cause analysis, any potential notifications to regulators, um, any statements involved in, in investigating incidents, or they can all be stored in that one instant on, on that system. And that just means that if, for example, as a home manager, you're out of the office one day and CQC come knocking, your deputy can go onto that incident and see everything that's saved there in that one place. Um, and that is that is good governance as well, keeping everything together um, and, and having it easily accessible when it needs to be accessed as well. Absolutely. And then I think that the, the output of that is once you've got your once you've reported and you've got all of that information, it's what you do with that information. It's, you know, it's having that um, the importance of having that uh, action plan in place. It's being able to look at the themes of trends. It's being able to understand how um, how you're going to use the information that you've got. So action plans. We talked a little bit about, you know, the Francis report and the Ockenden uh, reports that are ongoing East Kent. Um, in the Francis report, which was 
really one of the first times that NHS organisations had really been exposed as being inadequate in terms of its culture of fear and its safety. Um, when they looked at the uh, governance process, when they looked at the incident reporting process, they saw that there was loads and loads and loads of action plans. We're going to do this and we're going to do this. As, but there was, there was the, well, in Francis's words, there was a, a, many action plans with no action and no plan. Um, and I think that's where a lot of people fall down. You know, you see action plans with no nobody assigned to complete the action. The action is the, we would like to do this rather than a clear statement about what's going to be done. The date for completion is ongoing. You know, that's a really, really poor action plan when it's nebulous and you're not really sure how you're going to manage it or how or who's going to be responsible for it. So having clear action plans in place, having that openness, you know, do you have governance meetings regularly? Do you look at those action plans? Do you share your action plans with the whole of the organisation or your whole of your team? Or do you just keep it between yourself and a couple of interested parties that might do a little bit of work to make the 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 uh, the action plan look like it's been completed so it's one of the most important parts of this kind of incident process is to look at what actions you're going to take and then evaluate it later on down the line to make sure that actions any actions you've taken have been effective and to reduce the risk for for everybody else um i don't know if you've got anything to add to that jenny but that's okay. just just my my key um a bugbear I guess is action plans with the same actions again and again and again so you have one action plan in January right okay we'll do this then the same action plan in February oh yeah okay we need to do that if your action plans have keep gotten the same actions and they're not working we need to think of something different um, and think of a different approach so yeah that's that's my bugbear <laughs> And there's been a lot of talk about this, haven't the, the new um, patient safety uh, incident framework, PSERF, that's come out. They've, we're starting to move away from repetitive root cause analysis. Look, we know why somebody's fallen over. We know why somebody's fractured their hip. The last 10 people who've fallen over in the history of the, of the organisation have all the actions have been all the same. So why don't we move away from doing that root cause analysis? Because it's only going to tell us the same thing and really focus in on those actions that are going to make a difference. So we might need to change the lighting. We might need to change the carpets. We might need to do a little bit more falls training. We might need to be a bit more rigorous around falls risk assessments. We might even have to consider, you know, looking at perhaps videography in order to reduce the risk to this individual so what does what role does technology play in reducing this risk so we're moving away from very much the traditional view of a root cause analysis because we actually we've done the root cause analysis to death we know what's happening it's the actions that we're not putting in place so i think once you've got all of that then I think you've really got this ability to, to reduce the risk factors associated with, with harm. Wow. Thank you both. That's so many actionable insights that people can take away. I guess my last, um, just to wrap this up, what would be sort of like one key takeaway for both a worker and a care home to ensure they're doing their bit when it comes to reporting incidents the right way? Um, well, for me, it's um, don't fear reporting because reporting will ultimately result in a safety issue. Um, we, if, if we look at um, professional safety, we know that um, certainly for our organisation, there's a challenge around external temporary staff coming in to report incidents. There's always going to be that sort of psychological mistrust. Um, but actually... Our workforce, doesn't matter who, whether you work for the NHS or whether you work for social care um, or whether you work for temporary staffing agencies like Florence, your workforce is your biggest uh, and most important part of your of your organisation. And, you know, reporting incidents should not automatically become a disciplinary process. It should not automatically become a, an HR issue. It should you need to look at that instance and you need to say, OK, is it remedial, remediable? Is it recoverable? Does it really need referral to the NMC? Take a look at the NMC fitness to practice guidance. 
if you're working, if if you're if the if the person involved in the instance is an agency nurse or an agency care support worker, go back to that agency and say, okay, what do you offer in terms of support to us to deal with that incident or support to that individual? Um, and I'd be asking that as a health professional as well. What what do you how do you support me? So supporting your team, training your team, enabling your team to learn from incidents will equal a reduced risk, a better workforce and a healthier organisation overall. I think for me, um, for, for both workers and uh, home managers, I guess um, civility saves lives. Um, there's a big culture movement about that at the moment, um, that if you are rude to a colleague, um, you immediately they immediately withdraw into themselves. They're less likely to report things. They're less likely to want to put their head above the parapet, and that then puts patients at risk. Um, so if we can just get rid of rudeness, um, you know, encourage people to speak truth to power as well, um, and to have that humility when you're in power to hear those truths, um, for me, would go a long, long way to resolving the, the cultural and organisational issues that we often see around incident reporting. Amazing. I love that. Thank you so much both um, and thank you for our viewers tuning in. Um, if you do need any support and help in understanding governance better or practice in your home care or just for your staff, we please do get in touch with Florence. Uh, we do offer training and also uh, staff who are fully vetted and trained and understand um, the protocols of reporting safely and practically. Thank you so much and see you at our next webinar.